Okay, so I want to. So we're going to talk about a couple things. We're going to talk about just a couple more more hopeful signs of things, positive signs of things, uh, and then we're going to get on to uh, our our seafood data. You know, uh, looking at it and 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 starting to make sure people can enter stuff and and logistics logistics with that. But I want to start with uh, just a couple more examples of. Um, things that I think are positive, right? That again, we we've, we've spent most most of the semester talking about our problems and challenges or whatever. We had a couple examples uh, last week, and I just wanted to finish up with a couple uh, last few examples here. So again, this is that uh, ice plant, and I, I'd argue this is a, a huge success story that we did such a great job of removing something. We had to have a a um, example individual to to interpret to the visitors to um, explain to them what the what the problems were back in the day. I'd also say it's um, a, it's a success that we're transitioning through these phases, right? We've talked about the the eras of coastal rhetoric, of the imaginary, the sort of idealized landscape, the place where we seem to be in now in many cases, which is this sort of threatening, dangerous, either culturally threatening or or physical forces threatening, kind of dangerous uh, dangerous coastal zone, and and how we are. Um, working hard to move into this next phase, which is um, not as dangerous, much more inclusive, available to everyone. And, and again, like many things here, this is not done. I'm not trying to imply that this is, uh, you know, d you know check, check mark, move on to the next thing. But, but these are all positive signs. And these are all uh, uh, good things that have been happening in the last decade or two that weren't really happening um, in previous eras of coastal management. Another example of, um, of stuff coming together, now we've talked about the bureaucracy, we've talked about some of the challenges of some of our, or, or ineffectualness of some of our organizations, but there still is value in having these overarching agreements and understandings and frameworks, et cetera. And one that uh, was just passed last year and that um, our secretary of, our, our um, um, uh, what do I want to say? Um, the Secretary of State, God, I'm losing my brain. Secretary of State signed this year, which is um, the UN High, sea Tr High Seas Treaty. This is also known as the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions uh, Agreement. Now, this hasn't been ratified, right? So we're in the process of drafting it and working on it and all that kind of stuff, but we haven't. So, so it's still, it's still um, we're still working on things, but but this is a, an important framework. So this is essentially like a biodiversity thing beyond the 200, nautil, 200 mile nautical uh, uh, limit. And so that's a, that's a positive thing, I'd say, that we can still come together. And even in the open ocean that we've, we've never really regulated, to be able to have some agreements as to how we behave, that's a, that's a success, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, one of the key aspects of that uh, treaty is, is the notion that has, got, has gotten a lot of attention, as we've, we've touched on briefly in this class, but is the 30 by 30 policy, right? Which is the goal to have 30% of the, of the surface of the earth in, in one or more forms of, of no take or, or no exploitation um, reserves or protected area. And, and the um, High Seas Treaty has that goal as well, which is pretty crazy, right? Um, uh, in one sense, you'd think, why would we need to do a protected area in the middle of the open ocean? But as you guys have been you know, reading some of these articles and various things the last couple of weeks, watching videos of things like tuna and whales and all that kind of stuff, that there, there are challenges um, out in the open ocean, just like there's challenges here in the coastal zone or, or challenges on land. The High Seas Treaty would be one that's amongst like, a bunch of nations. Yes. Agree on yeah, so, so like, like all of the UN treaties, it's uh, you, you um, come together and draft something and then you have a sort of working document and then you have a convention of the parties that come together and, and meet. Usually it's annually, but it could be another periodicity where you come together and you work on drafts and this and that and you modify adjust and then people take it back to their countries and get their, their legislatures or their, their ruling authorities you know, feedback on it. And then they come back and they go back and forth. And then eventually when everybody agrees, and everybody, and everybody signs it, then we say, hey, here's what, all, here's what we think is the final agreement. And then that goes back to the individual uh, countries with their particular constitutions and whatever in their process. In our, in our country, it has to be ratified by the Senate is the entity that, that um, ratifies international agreements. And so uh, once enough 
and I don't know what the threshold for this is, but once enough, uh, you know, signers from across, uh, uh, and this will be, this is actually stipulated in the agreements. It's like, you know, once 94 or whatever the magic number is, um, countries have, have passed it, then it goes into effect. So up until that point, it might guide policy, um, as in like right now, it might guide our policy, but it's not officially our law yet. But, but even when we don't get to that point, it still is, is uh, helpful uh, in terms of moving the conversation forward, et cetera. Okay, I'd say another example of a success thing that we saw um, on our trip uh, is, uh, this is my son when he was very young, uh, uh, 20 years ago, um, looking at an elephant seal skull and having a great old time, wondering about those teeth are about. Um, this is a success story, right? Our, our um, elephant seals are a success story. They were massively overexploited. They were massively overharvested uh, to the point where they were presumed extinct. They were definitely extinct in the state of California in the late, by the late 1800s. Um, and uh, then in the very late 1800s, a small, very small population, the estimate is about 100 individuals, were found off Guadalupe Island, off of, off of Mexico, off of Baja. Um, and from that population, they have recovered. Um, and so now what used to be 100 individuals you know, over a century ago are now at least 160,000 individuals. And one of the reasons we went to the location we went to, and if you guys weren't able to come on our trip, I would encourage you guys, you know, when you have your next trip going up, up north, to go to the Elephant Seal Overlook um, uh, near Pages Blancas. It's really cool. That wasn't, that, didn't, that wasn't there when I was in school because in 1997, a pod broke off, or a pod's not the right term, but a group broke off from Año Nuevo, which is farther north, and started um, hanging out on the beaches near Pages Blancas. That was happening because the population was getting so big, essentially, it's like your house. Once like all your cousins and brothers and everybody are in there, at some point you're like, I gotta move out, right? So, so the fact that we have this new rookery and now new ones since this one has been created is a sign that the population is expanding, right? They need more space to breed, to reproduce, to do all that kind of stuff. And that's what we're seeing here in this figure. This is, this is uh, only up to um, about 10 years ago, but still you guys get the idea, which is, which is uh, uh, Channel Islands and in the central California population where, where we visited, um, things were low. These, these, in this case, this is births. Births of live babies were low, and they've you know gone up to from essentially a few hundred to you know tens of thousands every year, which is great. Um, and a really cool animal, um, you know, a paper just came out uh, a little bit ago showing how they dive incredibly deep, and they actually sleep while they're diving. So they, they don't sleep at the surface. So when they leave the rookery, they're mostly out at sea for months on end. Um, and so they, you know, you'd think that they just kind of float on the surface and like sleep, kind of hanging out, snoozing on the waves. No, they actually sleep underwater in like 20 minute bouts, which is pretty crazy. Um, so when we lose, were, were we to have lost this critter, that's a huge loss, right? For people trying to figure out sleep, people trying to figure out brain function, people trying to figure out all these other things, in addition to its having its own inherent value and its own worth. Um, by, by having this conservation success, we've preserved all this really cool biology and all this crazy physiology that is, at least with the vertebrate world, is probably, if not the craziest, one of the craziest um, uh, uh, diving physiologies on the planet, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, it's not all perfect, obviously things are, so even when we have these successes, things can be a little bit funky. And so in this case, this is the number of of seal, this is all up in uh, sort of essentially north of San Francisco. And in this case, we're looking at two different populations, the green population, the blue population. The green one is at the, or at the headlands uh, near where the Marine Mammal um, Center is, but basically the headlands. And then uh, farther up north at, at Drake's Beach near Drake's Estero, this is another population. And what we've seen is one of these populations has, has been on a, a decline for the last couple of years. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the whole population is declining because we've seen an increase in some of the other areas. So, so in addition to when we have these successes, um, sometimes we have to also change our metrics, right? Or have a more inclusive definition or, 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 you know, what was a great way to monitor something when it was rare 
is maybe not a great way or maybe not cost effective to monitor when something is, is in the recovery mode. So um, it's great that we have this and we can look at the effect of um, moving locations. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just say that, that uh, these guys are, are recovering. And so even though there's ups and downs, all the, everybody's on the upswing. The babies are on the upswing, the adults are on the upswing, all the individuals are, are, are doing relatively well. And so we now believe that the number of northern elephant seals is at or has exceeded the population before we started the sealing. So before that, that uh, European harvesting, intense harvesting method kicked in, we think this was probably about the number of northern elephant seals that were served out. Now, we, we have a genetic bottleneck here because they dropped down just a handful of individuals. And actually, that's a problem on our tour they mentioned that it's hard to do traditional genetics. So if I, if I was like, hey, is, is Molly, is this, is this, is this, um, is this uh, uh, pup Molly's, Molly's pup, right? And you could do a little quick genetic test, right? We could, we could take a little blood draw or whatever, and we could go back and we could say, um, are they related? A lot of the common markers that we use. <laughs> Sorry, I was making like bastard seal Great, excellent. <laughs> Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the tools that we use to do that, the quick and dirty, kind of like off the shelf type stuff, don't work on elephant seals because they, they have such low genetic diversity, um, I can't easily tell if that pup is hers or not. And so, uh, and so obviously the worry there is we have some disease, some marine outbreak, some, some whatever, and all, and instead of just a subset of the population being susceptible, or the majority being susceptible, it could be that everybody, or virtually everybody would be susceptible. So we're worried about genetic bottlenecks. Again, we're not out of the woods, but um, in terms of eco impact on the ecosystem, all that kind of stuff, they've recovered. Like they, they've totally recovered. So that's a conservation success story, right? Again, we, we don't talk about the success as much as we talk about the problems, problems, problems. Right? Yeah, so, so Ryan's question is, is there a, is there a is, what's the genetic population structure, say, between Channel Islands populations and Northern California populations? And essentially, very, very little. So very, very little. What about like Southern? Throughout the, the entire species range, very, very little. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, not, it's not zero, uh, so I wouldn't say that, but, but compared to just about every other vertebrate, it's, it's basically, they're basically indistinguishable. They don't have the same level as say a deer population or, a, or um, whatever, wolves or, or bobcats or whatever. Cool. Okay, uh, in general, um, again, we need to do better with our fisheries. We are not perfect. Things are not ideal by any stretch of the imagination. But um, this is where we are now. This is the most recent US-wide fishery stock assessment. Um, and uh, uh, the vast majority of these guys are not in the active decline stage, right? So that doesn't mean they're all recovered, that doesn't mean they're all doing well. But, but uh, for the ones that we have data on, which is not all of our species, we have what are known as data deficient uh, fisheries, and that's the majority of things. But, but for the guys that we can measure, the salmons and the squids and things like that of the, of the world, um, uh, the majority are no longer subjected to the same level of overfishing pressure. We'll talk about that when we get to the data, our, our data in a second. But, but um, that's, that's a good thing. But the bad thing is that's come at a cost of us eating more seafood from elsewhere, right? So we've sort of decided to protect our fish stocks and then been, now we're a little bit less concerned with what's going on elsewhere. But, but at least for our fish popu populations, they are doing better than they have been historically. So that's a good thing. Um, and while we've tried very hard, our species tried very hard to eliminate whales from the planet, we did our best. Um, we failed, at least failed so far. Um, and we still have a lot of active migration, right? So, so that's a cool success story, that we still have these critters that are moving carbon and energy from the Arctic down to the tropics, and, and, or sometimes the tropics and, and vice versa. Um, uh, uh, so let's talk specifically about humpback whales. Um, so this, in this case, this is a South Atlantic population. 
the red line is the whaling, is the harvest of individuals that was um, uh, kicking off uh, really big in the late 1800s with this species because we took out the other ones that we thought were more valuable. And the green line is the, is the population uh, size, the total. So total number of individuals on the right, uh, excuse me, total number of individuals on the left, excuse me, left axis, green line, left axis. On the right, red axis is the har harvesting. And what we see is that, at least with our Western um, uh, South Atlantic uh, um, um, uh, uh, what do I call it, DSP, DPS, uh, uh, I can't remember the acronym off the top of my head. I'm not sleeping enough. Um, but in any event, uh, it's, it's the uh, designated population segment, I guess is what I'm supposed to call it, designated population segment. Um, that group of whales is basically up to the pre-exploitation levels. So that's a good thing. Um, we also see recovery of humpbacks in other places too. So for example, this is the Pacific Northwest. So this is up near Seattle area. Um, and this is the number of sightings uh, since the early 90s. So we'd occasionally, in the, in the early 90s, you occasionally, very rarely see a humpback in you know, those near shore waters. And now um, you see them all the time. You see them all the time. So the popular whale watching businesses and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and we talk about the, the particular population that we work on um, of humpbacks. Uh, uh, also good news. So in the 1980s, we had about, of, on, this, on this stock and this, this fishery population here, um, we had about 2,000 individuals that spent um, the winters in Maui, in the, in the Maui Channel. And then, uh, and these, so these are the orange guys, these are the orange lines here. Um, and then would go up to Alaska in the summertime. So they go between Alaska and, and Hawaii. Um, that population, um, is up to at least 21,000 individuals now. So that's, that, that's, that's good. Are they recovered? Are they totally perfect? No, but they're way, way, way better than they were you know, several decades ago. And it, overall, the species also has been doing quite well. So the species in the 1960s was about 5,000 total individuals, and now we're talking about 135,000 individuals planet-wide. That, that's, that's, that's all over the planet. So those are, uh, those are you know, good things, positive things, um, successes. That came about because of pressure. So I was reading an article this weekend about um, how, uh, it was very interesting. It was basically how, how, how stupid it was to use a polar bear to get people's attention to climate change. And that it went down the whole silly, stupid rabbit hole about people overanalyzing and saying all this crud. Um, uh, it's important to have symbols, right? So um, no symbol is perfect. No symbol completely tells the whole story of your management challenge or whatever, but, but they're helpful, right? They're helpful, especially in the early phase, breaking in and communicating to the public. And Save the Whales was a very powerful, very popular message in the 60s and 70s that led to the International Whaling Commission eventually, um, and, and lots of pressure, to eventually um, uh, stopping, stopping commercial whaling. Um, or at least the vast majority of people stop commercial whaling. There's still a few that are doing it under the guise of scientific data collection. But, um, but so, that's, so that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. There, there's, there's different strategies and, and tactics we can take to achieve a conservation goal or a management goal. And, and recovery of the whale, not all whales are back and by any means, but, but um, we know what to do. You stop throwing an exploding spear into these guys, and that's, that, that helps out a lot. Um, I think, I think this, is, this cartoon seems to really represent a lot of, we have conversations um, these days about climate change and everything, and we seem to have this, this seems to tell the story uh, about uh, folks that like, oh my God, everything's ending, everything's ending, you guys are like, the world's ending, nobody's listening, and then it's either your family or friends or people you see around, they're like, hey man, science is a joke, just relax, it's all good, and it seems this really, one, super stressful for a lot of you, but then it also seems even more stressful because it seems like not everybody understand, not everybody's freaked out, right? It's like some people are just kind of like, it's cool, I'm gonna go get a beer, you know, kind of deal. Um, and so we've had lots of conversations about that uh, uh, 
uh, over the semester and, and before, and I think we'll have it after. But I think it's important to make sure we're looking with real eyes, okay? So real change is happening. Again, the crises get all the attention. Um, solutions get much, much less attention on average. So here's some example. This is the growth of key energy production. Um, and, th and this is real, right? This is, this is actual. So, so have a look at what all the doomers said, that we can't solve the problems, right? So the gray lines here, the gray lines were the projected. There's, there's solar, wind, and this is uh, battery electric BEVs, right? So the gray lines were the projections in that year. So this line here is in 2016, people thought that by 2030, we'd be about this level of electric uh, vehicles, right? And the same for how much wind uh, generation capacity, how much solar energy uh, generation capacity, right? And what do you see? You see the estimates were way, way, way low. And, 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 and not just a little bit off, but like orders of magnitude off, right? And so, so we're, we're doing much better than you would have thought even three, four, five years ago. Certainly more than 10, 12 years ago. Um, here's what our coal use is like in our country right now, right? So again, these are the projections as to our coal usage. In 2007, we were projected to add another 500 terawatt hours of electrical production just from coal, right? Uh, and, and then in 2010, so, so we're, we've dropped below even the predictions of 2019 currently. So we can do this stuff faster than it seems, right? Not always. I'm not saying it's panacea. I'm not saying it happens every single time. But, but if we put our mind to it, we can change things. Here's the actual cost of electricity right now, right? And this, this is uh, levelized for the, across the globe. Um, what are the lowest things? Lowest thing is this purple line. What the hell is that? Onshore wind. Uh, and then this mustard color, fixed solar. That would be like the solar on your roof, your rooftop solar. Or for that matter, our, so our panels that are out, on, uh, out in the field here, our solar field on campus, those don't articulate. So those, those would fall under this fixed, uh, fixed axis solar. Um, and check it out, right? It's cheaper. We're producing electricity cheaper now than we are with oil or gas or coal. That's the reality, right? That's not, that's not, uh, that's not some made up number. That's not some projection in the future. So it is cheaper to, to use these alternatives now going forward, despite what some people would have you believe. Andrew? The, the increase in the cost of gas, is that from like scarcity? Or is that from more like taxes put on like the scarcity? Uh, so this wouldn't be, this is this, all this stuff together, but this is globalized too. So this is, so some countries really, really subsidize. So, um, so I don't know how they accounted for that, but it's accounted for in here. Um, so this is the, the actual cost of production uh, as reali realized co uh, cost of production. Cool. And so then I would say the same thing for other things, right? So things, so right now the, the conversation is, uh, this week is about the Cybertruck because that's gonna be unveiled after four years of waiting for this you know, big electric pickup. Um, but, uh, but, you know, uh, huge demand for electric, electric hybrids, um, and that has sort of stalled a little bit this year. But by stall, well, that's what everybody's talking about. So the rhetoric lately is all, oh, yeah. Uh, um, what they mean is the growth rate isn't as steep as it was last year. So it's still expanding. We're still adding lots of um, uh, um, vehicles. And um, now... I'm not necessarily going to say you should buy a Ford F-150 Lightning for whatever the hell it is, $60,000, $70,000, whatever, right? But the average, uh, 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 the average electric vehicle now is actually cheaper than internal combustions over the lifespan of the car. I just read another thing yesterday to sort of double check this from some crazy, insane, bizarre political uh, hit piece from a think tank in Texas, and they totally made up a bunch of crazy numbers. It was insane assumptions. They claimed it cost $17 a gallon, the equivalent of $17 a gallon to run an electric. That's totally not true. This is well-researched, rigorous data. And this is saying that now, over the lifespan of the vehicle, it's become cheaper 
on average, not every single one, but on average to have an electric vehicle versus having a traditional internal combustion vehicle now. And that's happening not just in the US, but that's happened in India, it's happened in Europe, and it's happened in China. And as we go forward, it's only gonna get uh, you know, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Handing out, nobody's, nobody's handing out stuff, but there are different. Well, like the leasing thing. Where... Yeah, so the leasing has started to become a big thing. Yeah. So there are definitely uh, focal demonstration projects where like a local utility, whatever, um, will okay. either give away free or heavily discounted vehicles to see how people use them and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. Is that US prices? Yes. Oh, well, it's, it's all, it's, uh, yes, that? yes, yes. It's, it's all standardized to U.S., but they, they're, they're done in the individual countries, but yeah. yeah. Is that um, cost per person or, or like environmental? Uh, no, I think this is just operational. So this is just money. This is not environmental impact. This is just money. So I want you, like, you know, you guys get an inheritance. You're like, I'm going to go buy a new car. Like what that cost would be if you bought that car today and then operated it over the average life you know, seven, 12 years, whatever, whatever it ends up being of the vehicle. And, and, if, and if I bought an internal combustion engine and you bought a, uh, a battery electric vehicle, um, on average, you're gonna pay less over that seven years than I will. So, um, yeah. Have they, or I don't know if you've seen like the calculations of the difference of people who have electric cars when they have solar like charging at their house versus regular? Uh, sure. I mean, right now, most of the early adopters is that that's how, that's how that's what most people are now. So most people that have uh, hybrid vehicles right now, or hybrid, excuse me, uh, electric vehicles right now, are people that are charging at home. So they're most people that have a garage. So they tend to be on average wealthier than than a random draw of the public on average. Um, and so those folks are more likely to have solar at home. But regardless, they're more like, but they almost all or the vast majority have a garage. So even if they don't have solar, even if they don't have a fast charger, they can plug their car in at night. The challenge now is we're going mainstream is now we're talking about people that are in apartments that don't have a shared garage. And, it's, and, it, and that's the population we're trying to hit now with how do we get the charging capacity to those folks um, so that they can still feel comfortable buying a vehicle and have no problem charging up, but, but they don't have. So, so the charger network is the, is the current focus of a lot of the policy and stuff. Um, cool. But I, was, I didn't want to like, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. I wasn't really wanting to go down the, the rabbit hole, but just to say, right, the largest source of emission, of carbon emissions in the US are from tra our transportation sector. And it looks impossible. And we should be going faster. And we're not going fast enough. And all that stuff is totally true. But to say that we're, we've made no progress and that we're all dooming, dooming and we can't ever solve anything, that is not a factually honest take. Um, so same with our fisheries, right? We, we have to be mature and say that, say that nothing might be perfect, but let's not say that nothing has ever worked ever. And let's not say that, that, that we have no idea what to do and we're lost. Um, we know in most cases what the path forward is. Um, it's a matter of enacting it, getting support, et cetera. Yeah, right. Whatever happened to the bullet train for California? I think it was totally in the dust. The bullet train is not uh, technically totally in the dust, but it's basically in the dust. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was a great idea. Yeah. Uh, oh well. Yeah. Yeah. So that that was that was a great that was a great idea that I, I think I mean that's not really a coastal management issue but but it is a management issue and that was that was a great idea from on high. Um, and it, it was passed with a ballot uh, with a proposition and some various things but it never really 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 got the buy-in of the on the ground folks Central Valley in particular Central Valley folks. And so it was, it was sort of a top-down solution. I mean, the, the, we could do like several classes just on that topic, but, but in summary, it wasn't, there wasn't a huge grassroots movement in the, along the corridor of the, of the train to demand this, that they wanted this, let's do this. And they didn't see the benefits for themselves. And in particular, because by the very nature of a bullet train, it wasn't going to, even like with a regular conventional service, like, okay, well, we'll do this. Well, at least we'll be able to get on the train. But it's like, 
uh uh-uh. you know it's going to start off at bakersfield and it's going to end up in oakland or something right yeah. it's like they're not so it's it literally just would blast past all these communities so people are like what's the benefit for me so so that was there were many challenges with that but um huh. but yeah. uh cool all right great uh, other other ones. What are, what are some other what are some other successes that you guys really um, uh, can think about? Maybe we read about this semester. You saw any other ones? Um, climate change is bringing more surf. <laughs> so there you go. A, 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 a more crazy climatologically charged world is is more intense surf breaks. Okay, good. Right, try and electrify the whole, uh, yeah, good. And, um, electric, what is this whole thing? Tugboat. Tugboat, <laughs> right, okay, yeah. The hardest things to electrify are airplanes um, because of the weight to, you know, petroleum is a really, petroleum is a really dense fuel, right? I mean, like, it, it, that's the reason why it fueled the, the Industrial Revolution, right? It's it's really really good at generating a lot of work from a small volume of material, um, and so our planes use jet fuel, which is which is even even higher octane than what we put in our cars, and so so that's a really bang for the buck fuel. Um, so that's a very very difficult one to replace. Similarly, another one that's really difficult to replace is long haul shipping. So those guys use the worst of the worst bunker fuel usually, like very, traditionally very, you know, lots of soot comes out of the tailpipe and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they have to move in, like modern, modern freight is insane, right? It is this massive city block of a, of a, of a vessel that's gonna move all this material across the ocean. And so, um, so that's also one that, uh, in other words, the extreme uh, low efficiency and the extreme high efficiency are the two endpoints that are that will be the most difficult to decarbonize. Um, and so that's why we're starting with like the personal fleet in the middle, and then as, as Ashley's saying, then we're we're beginning to move into more of like the commercial trucking and various things. But we're starting at the easiest, low, lowest hanging fruit, and then we'll eventually get to those more difficult to electrify uh, options. Other, other examples of, of positive things you guys saw this semester or things that you thought were cool? You spoke, you spoke about uh, the coral reef in Australia or something and how they're, that there is uh, any type of, if there's a subset of coral reef that's right. resistant to... Uh, yeah, so varieties of coral that, that seem to be surviving. So my son's um, essentially basically like a capstone project he's doing down there. Down there. Um, he's been resurveying <coughs> these reefs that were um, heavily bleached in a series of bleaching events from 2014 to 2017, and also as hurricanes came in at the same time. And, um, and they're not perfect, but um, higher coral cover in many of them than, not all, but many of them than before. Um, the diversity is lower, so it's not the same number of species, but at least as far as like the reef building corals, they're, they're still there, they're, they're still going. And I just heard a report two days ago from the bleaching event in um, Florida, which I think I, I think I mentioned this to you guys. I, I, it came up as a comment in WSN, and I was surprised by it. But um, that anomalous heat wave in the waters off of Florida, it only ended about three weeks ago. Or no, that's not true. It only ended about four weeks ago, which is crazy. So um, so only now we, are we to quote unquote background, you know, temperatures in those waters. And so um, now that the temperatures have gone back, the researchers that grabbed their small handful of corals that they'd planted out before, um, Moat Marine Lab and those folks, they, they, you know, as fast as they could, they grabbed a lot of those individuals, brought them back into the lab so they wouldn't cook in the, in the almost boiling hot water. Um, and now they've been going and putting those guys back out uh, starting the last few weeks. Um, and they anecdotally noted that it seems like um, there, there are a couple of varieties that seem to be doing better than the others. So there are strains that, you know, it's, it's natural selection, right, that are going to be able to handle the higher temperature. 
Um, the question is, can we, can we get them fast enough? Um, and the folks in Australia are leading that effort in terms of very aggressive outplanning of, of heat resistant varieties at scale. The Florida folks are kind of doing it, but it's, it's a little bit of a smaller scale effort, but the, the Great Barrier Reef is a, is a much larger effort. Babe. For corals, could you, is there a way to, to mix the breeding of uh, warmer water corals with the ones that aren't as um, stable? Like yeah, I mean, I mean, so I, 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 I know three people doing their PhDs on stuff related to that. Yeah, so that, that's a huge, that's a hot topic. Yeah. yeah. All right, good. Other ideas, other ideas of positive things you guys saw or, or hopeful signs in terms of coastal management over the semester. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I, th I think I think deep sea mining is 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 a possible. Um, it, you know, we've not released the environmental impact report yet, so we can't fully say. But again, um, but I've I've seen several reports in the last couple of weeks about the impacts of mining in on Native American lands in Minnesota for one lithium mine, other lithium mines in. Um, in the Sierras and in Nevada, and then huge problems with some mines in Indonesia, right? So, so there's no free lunch, right? There's no free lunch, and and it may well there may well be jellyfish impacts uh, to the deep sea mining efforts. I mean, hopefully not, but there may well be. But again, we need to sort of look at this at the at the planetary scale. That that what where is the least impactful, right? And 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 to also in the context of environmental justice, right? Where's where's the least impactful, and also. Where's the, where is it fair, right? For, for lack of a better word, right? Like, 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 should we really keep doing this to these folks uh, that we've sort of raked over the coals for all this time? This might be more like, kind of like an obvious question, but do you think that there's a political drive in order to stop uh, deep ocean mining? So that oh, 100%. Are you kidding me? 100%. 100%. Let me tell you. So there's massive lobbying campaigns from China. Massive, 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 massive. Um, Greenpeace doesn't want it to happen. The, um, uh, when we were at WSN, uh, my wife went to the aquarium, and they ended one of their shows with stop deep sea mining. Like buy sustainable seafood and stop deep sea mining. So there are massive, massive, very, very aggressive um, campaigns to, to say we shouldn't do it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just say that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Other other positive side. I want to end on a, a positive note, a, an optimistic note. Okay, fine. I'll end us on an optimistic note. I'll end us on an optimistic note. Okay. So this is for. Oh, sorry. Ashley has. A, Ashley has. What's your optimistic note? 